Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and also help them to succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas, and I graduated with a degree in civil engineering from UT Austin. And I'm currently pursuing my MBA at Auburn. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. Before Matt introduces our guests, I wanted to share some breaking news with you. EMI is excited to announce the launch of their newest podcast on the Civil Engineering Media and Entertainment Network, This Week in Civil Engineering, also known as TWICE. TWICE is a 10 to 15 minute weekly audio and video podcast hosted by practicing civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers bringing listeners the latest industry news. We recognize that none of us have the time to read up on all of the news we'd like to anymore, and soon we won't have to thanks to TWICE. You can learn more about the show and subscribe when it launches in mid-September at www.twice.news. That's T-W-I-C-E dot news. Now I'd like to introduce our guest for this episode. Renz Hayes, PE, is the principal at H&O Structural Engineering. He completed both his bachelor's as well as his master's of science in civil engineering at Western Polytechnic Institute. He's a certified value growth advisor and a hands-on leader leading solution-driven teams with an emphasis on understanding the needs and perspectives of both architects and developers. Uh, Renz believes that it's important to become a lifelong learner as it leads to compounding growth and opportunities. And in his private time, he enjoys golf, water skiing, snowboarding, CrossFit, and a good laugh. Now let's jump into our conversation with Renz Hayes. Renz, welcome to the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Thanks for having me. Perfect, I'm so glad we have you with us today. Uh, Before we dive into much further, can you tell our audience a little bit more about what it is you do on a daily basis at H&O Structural Engineering? Sure. I'll start with a little bit about H&O. We're a structural engineering firm based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and we're focused primarily on mid and high-rise building structures. Um, As a principal at the firm, I was co-founder with Jeremiah O'Neill. My primary day-to-day roles are um, and honestly, HR functions, business development, uh, marketing, and then I handle a lot of the new leads. So I'm doing all of the uh, proposals at this current state. Uh, most of those functions as we scale will be um, roles that we'll be hiring for over the next several years. And Renz, uh, I know you're, you know, you're, you're one of the principals in a successful firm. Uh, one of the things that you know, I was wondering and what I see a lot in common of with principals is, you know, they have, they have to have their, their company values in check, uh, their visions for, for the firm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about having that, maybe setting that out, kind of the bigger picture of what it's like to be a principal and trying to get those values out to your firm? Absolutely. So uh, something I think a lot of companies skip, a lot of companies start by, um, when a founder or co-founders, they, they think that um, they excel at really executing the day-to-day work, right? And they've developed relationships and confidence that they can deliver that worked product. So they go off on their own and they start acquiring clients and they get too many clients so they have to hire help. They never really thought of it as how do I build an organization that can continue, sustainably grow and continue to deliver value. Um, so what happens when a business starts that way is they kind of get in a hamster wheel. They're always chasing that organizational structure to drive value, but they're kind of caught in working in the business instead of working on the business. So um, something we really lead with and emphasize a lot is the importance of mission, vision, and values. Um, So mission um, defines why your company exists. This should be extremely short and concise, and you want everybody in your company to know what your mission is at the drop of a hat. Um, I I would 
expect in most companies, they have like these long winded um, mission statements that talk about like industry leading quality and value um, and like great team and we deliver this product for an ultimate client experience. Um, but if you asked even just the top 10 leaders of the company, none of them could recite or write down what the mission statement actually is. So it's really just lip service on the wall. It doesn't really impact how the organization runs. So coming back to mission, it defines your why. Why does your company exist? So at H&O, our company is a better, our mission is a better experience. And we mean that with respect to our team and for our clients. And then our vision, a vision paints the picture of where your company is going. Um, a super important piece of that is that you write your vision in the present tense. So you're painting a picture of your company in five years and it can be, it's an internal document. It can be extremely long. You want to define the type of work, who you're working with, where your revenue is coming from. Um, but writing it in the present tense, what you're doing as a team is you're collectively agreeing to start acting like that company you will become in five years because the importance you want to develop the expectations and the behaviors of that company you're going to be. That's the only way to get there. The core values, what those do is those guide culture and decision making. You only want three to five values because you want them to be, again, short, concise, such that everyone on your team remembers them. But those really drive that decision making and build culture. So when you think about leading an organization, if you haven't defined why your company exists, where you're going, or core values to make decisions on, how can you motivate your team and how can you expect them to all make decisions and kind of be rowing the boat in the same direction if you don't have, if you haven't clearly laid that out. Owners and leadership will make inconsistent decisions if they don't have clarity on those things. It's really hard to keep all of that top of mind if it's not something you've vetted and make sure is really critical to your organization. Now, I really like that point about, you know, having that clear mission and the core values because, you know, that is what the company is. I think a lot of probably like middle engineers, like you were saying, you know, they can uh, get their clients, but then they end up working, you know, just getting the stuff out, just getting the stuff out, just getting the stuff out. And I think as an industry, you know, if you don't have that business acumen or that uh, bigger picture, having like the vision and the core values, I think it kind of does lead to, you know, having a, a business that isn't run very well. And I think it contributes to the, you know, how come engineers aren't paid as much as they should? Well, maybe because the bigger picture of like starting a business is, um, are you an engineer or are you a business owner? Are you looking at it as a business owner? Uh, because, you know, one strategy that doesn't seem to work, <laughs> at least in our industry, is, uh, you know, lower your prices so you can be the lowest, lowest bid, lowest bid. And then that kind of just drives the whole industry down. So I really think that's great on how you do need to look at it from a business perspective and as a business owner and getting those core values right to have a clear direction for your team. Yeah, we look at like planning and leadership as like, it's one of the, in our perspective, one of the eight core functions of a business. You need to develop a competency in all eight areas. But if you don't have clarity and mission, vision values, and you don't have a framework and clarity on how you deliver value to a client, you're really, you don't really have an organizational structure that's gonna allow the workforce to grow and advance their career. You're, there's eventually gonna be a ceiling and the limitation isn't on the individuals working in the company, it's limited by the organizational structure of the company. And we see that as a real kind of hurdle in the, in the industry as a whole, and that's kind of AEC is, um, without that organizational structure, it becomes very horizontal, right? In our, in our field, leaders can grow a company to several hundred people without proper organizational structure, and largely because expectations on designing, say, a building or a bridge or, say, a civil site, um, when you pass that work off to somebody that's capable of doing the work, it's very clear on what the delivery is of that service. So you can grow to several hundred people with really a lack of clarity through an entire organization. But that's where we see, that's the leading cause of burnout in our opinion, in our industry. And that's why you see people leave architecture and engineering 10, 15 years into their career to other industries because they just, the only thing they have to look forward to is a more complicated or larger project. And that really fuels growth for a decade plus. But over time when they realize 
that's all they have to look forward to and they don't have clarity on how to advance their career, that can be really frustrating and that's really leads to burnout. Absolutely. And those core values serve as such a great, um, a great roadmap for really what those core competencies are that you want them to excel in, in different roles and in different ways within your company. Wonderful. I, I want to dive into that really quickly before, uh, before we continue with some of these questions about, about your career and how you've gotten here. But um, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in is, you know, you have a bachelor's and a master's in all of this deep technical structural engineering education, and here you are a business pioneer. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got to this point in your journey? Why it was that, you know, is it, was there something, was there an, ev uh, an event or something in your career where you, you sparked a, a change in interest? Um, why did you think that this was a place that you wanted to bring your career? Sure. So with an engineering background, I, I, guess, I guess I grew up in a family. My family business is a structural steel and miscellaneous iron company. So I was exposed to leading a business early in my career. Uh, and after working for a larger firm and getting my engineering license, I actually exited that company to help run the steel company. Um, which exposed me to the many challenges that you face uh, running a business. And at that same time, I, I learned the importance of becoming a lifelong learner. Um, I think one of the, I don't know who said it, but uh, you'll be the same person you are today in five years, other than the people you meet and the books you read. So uh, a big part of my education is I just seeked out audiobooks. I had a commute. I, I've commuted for an hour to two hours a day for over six years. And I just found like as I face new challenges in running a business that I should seek experiences from others. And the fastest way to do that is through books around those topics, whether that be marketing, sales, um, emotional intelligence for managing different personalities and understanding people's personalities. Um, and those things really helped round out my business awareness. Um, and actually, as we started to grow that steel business, we were launching the engineering business, Jeremiah and I, at h and um, And we, we found that we had all this knowledge from all these books and we would try and tinker with these certain areas of each business and, and try to improve them to get like mediocre results or find other hurdles. And it became really frustrating. It was like, where do we start? And that's where I got exposed to the uh, Certified Value Growth Advisor Program, which is a formal certification in the mergers and acquisitions market. Um, that whole industry really opened my eyes to how businesses were evaluated and how value was perceived in, in all different uh, areas other than construction and engineering. And in that program, I learned about the eight core functions of a business, um, all businesses, not just engineering architecture. And those are planning, leadership, sales, marketing, people, operations, finance, and legal. And so the important thing is that you maintain balance in all eight of those areas to properly grow a business. The challenge is most businesses are strong in two or three of those core areas. And they're typically blind to the value of the other five areas. So what happens when things get tough is they try to improve in the two or three areas that they're already superior at. Um, which actually hurts, that, that increases the risk of the actual company relative to their production and size. So that's increasing the company specific risk, which actually increases their cost of capital. So it, it really hurts their financial position. But when you build a balanced organization, um, you really are stable for the size company you are, and you're well poised to have intrinsic value. And when I say intrinsic value, that is predictable, sustainable, and transferable value within a company. Um, and when you do that, your cost of capital goes down, your cost of debt goes down. Um, it, it puts you in a really good position to grow and scale and create a better work environment. Absolutely. I think that is so valuable. And I really appreciate you diving into that, that, that background and, and even a little bit into you know, what it looks like, what these eight competencies are um, to run a business. I'm sure we have some listeners on right now who are thinking, wow, this is such a completely different topic from, it's a little bit left field for us um, as far as bringing, bringing this core competency of business acumen um, to, to our listeners. But to anyone, even if you're a young engineer um, who's listening in right now, there's, 
there's such a value. And if you do have aspirations to, to move, to, to make any kind of development in your career, whether you want to go from EIT to PE, whether you want to be a project engineer or a senior project manager or a partner within the firm that you work at or start your own business, um, it's so important to know how your business is run, how the company is run. Because while you may be younger in your career and you may, the majority of your, of your day might be crunching calculations and uh, modeling things and going through, you know, go through the execution piece, your boss and your boss's boss are looking at, are we being more, most productive in the way that we, we produce work? Are we bringing in a steady amount of climate clients? Are we keeping clients happy? Are we communicating? Are we transparent with our work? And all of these different things that your management is looking at towards, towards your performance now and maybe your future development or future roles is always business centric because they are responsible for that business piece. And so these, the, all these pieces that, that Brenz is sharing with us is so important to your future growth, whether or not you want to be a business person, quote unquote, um, it's, it's important to know how things work, how the machine works and how you make it work best for you. Um, so there's really some fantastic tidbits here that, that he's sharing with us. And, and I hope you're, you're, connecting the dots and seeing the bigger picture outside of just the work that you do today. That's very well said. Um, I'd like to add to that. So um, as someone, as an employee, as an engineer who's working in a company and you're sensing frustrations from things that you're running into on a day-to-day -day basis, I would challenge you to really try to think and identify what is the root cause of that frustration? Because likely what's creating the frustration is a symptom. It's likely not the root cause. So um, if you're looking to advance your career and position yourself for career growth, um, one way to do that is to really round out your understanding of like organizational structure and how you deliver value to a client. Because if you're even within a company, say you're not at a spot where you want to launch a new company, but if you want to just advance your career and increase your value to the company, being able to identify root causes and help come up with a solution is a tremendous opportunity. Um, to, to advance your career. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I wanted to, you guys said it so well, but it, it is really, that's what I tell the, you know, younger engineers, of course, you're an engineer, focus on your technical stuff, but then that's your foundation. You have to be technical, but as you go further and further in your career, develop these other skills, because that's what's really going to help you out and be a better problem solver. Like you said, Renz, if, if you can just go a step beyond just technical problem solving and you can go into like the business aspects, the people aspects of problem solving and how to add value. I think that's when your firm will realize that, you know, you're, you're not just a commodity. You're someone that, you know, that they can't just hire a computer program and do your job. You actually have value to, to your firm and to the clients too. So uh, great points. Well said, Matt. Um, that brings up another thought for me. Um, if you're, as an engineer, right, we are all well-educated and leading very respected careers. Um, engineering, like other skills, say a mechanic, a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, if all you do is work on that one specific skill, unless you become like the top 0.1% of the ability in that skill, you're gonna have a ceiling earning potential because that skill only produces so much value in the industry. So if you're looking to increase your earning potential, you need to be advancing in other competencies within your own control. So very similar to the eight areas of business that I discussed, you can apply that same kind of perspective to yourself if you're really exceptional at engineering, but you're deficient in how you talk to colleagues or advance the engineering skill set of other like entry level engineers in your company or manage clients, if you're deficient in those other areas, you're really um, you're minimizing your overall earning potential. So if you be, if you try to focus on and be aware of where your weaknesses might be and look to improve at those or at least building awareness in those areas, you're able to leverage your strengths while minimizing your weaknesses. Renz, can you go into a little bit more about your, your leadership style and your leadership values and how someone that kind of wants to get into that leadership position, how can they implement that and adopt, adopt kind of that style that's effective? 
Yeah, absolutely. So when I think of like the, the environment we were created or we've created and are continuing to advance at H&O, um, going back to mission, vision, values, like our mission is to create a better experience. And we say that in the context, again, for our team and our clients. So we're talking internal with our team. Um, the, we think people in our, in our industry, they're seeing these poor organizational structures that limit career growth, um, they lack design processes. So it's kind of a trial by fire, right? You learn how to design a building or a bridge by just working under somebody else and kind of picking up and asking questions. Um, so it takes a certain person to be really successful and advance quickly in that environment. So what can an organization do to create a better working environment there, right? So when we come back to our core values, um, our core values are embrace growth, be a partner, and be responsive. And so embrace growth is really, um, it's about being becoming a lifelong learner and be willing to constantly evaluate how we operate, right? So um, never can an answer be that's how we've always done it. That's the best way, right? Like you really got to vet your process. And when you create an environment where everyone's trying to grow and it's a learning environment, um, I'm going to be a little sidetracked, but we think a really toxic environment is one where people are afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are really an opportunity for an entire organization to improve. So if you have an environment where somebody makes a mistake and you really scold that individual for making that mistake, when if they haven't been trained in what competencies or skill set, and there's not a design process to follow for that person to avoid that mistake, is it really the individual's mistake or is it the organization's mistake? Right. But uh, not all leaders, and I would say most leaders, are unaware of the deficiencies in their organization that led to that employee mistake or a mistake on that project. So when you can create an environment that's a positive in a learning environment. Those are really lessons learned, not necessarily mistakes. Here's the situation that we faced. Here was the result. Here's how we overcame that. Here's what I think we should do to improve our organization and our design process. So uh, if I were to take that back to me as a leader, like those are really, those are, those are values that I really believe in. Like kind of coming back to my overall like business development and understanding of organizational value, that's purely through lifelong learning, uh, not being afraid to fail, and really being able to take a step back and look at like cause versus symptom, right? Like what can you do today that's developing the new behaviors and competencies that lead to the growth that you want to achieve? And so you take that individually and you put that into an organization and that's kind of, that's really the culture we're looking at. That's fantastic. Uh, quick sidebar to any of our listeners who are still in college and maybe haven't gone for that first full-time employment yet. Um, when you're looking at different companies, uh, I mean, Renz is telling you as a leader that he his personal values make up those core values that are written on their wall or on their website. So when you're doing research on different companies, uh, I would encourage you to, to really take a hard look at that mission and vision statement and see if it aligns with what you want out of your career. Um, and if those core values tend to align with your personal values, it means you might be looking at a good fit um, from, a, from a, an employment standpoint. So just, just something to think about. Um, I do want to focus on, you, you started to talk a little bit about mistakes. And um, one of the things that I, I know is kind of creates a, a vicious cycle is that when you're thinking about taking that next step, fear and doubt are some of those big, scary things that hold us back from doing the right things. And unfortunately, fear and doubt can stem from a mistake and mistakes can be a result of fear and doubt in, in your own personal uh, capabilities. So I'm curious, these are two of the biggest hurdles anyone in their career, specifically engineers who like to be right and do things correctly all the time, um, can, can really battle against when they're trying to develop themselves. Um, what are some of those limiting beliefs that you believe prevent one from advancing the career? And how do you suggest, how can you advise others to overcome those, those barriers? Uh, that's a great question. So one, I think the biggest fear of making mistakes stems from people think they as a person and their character is judged by their performance. When I would argue that that is 
absolutely not true. You should never judge yourself and your character based on your performance and your job and a sport and anything. Right? Your character is really like um, trust. Like, are you humble? Like, do you help others? Like, are you are you giving? Um, when I come when I come back to like making the decisions and helping overcome fear, um, I like to do an exercise that's. Um, it actually stems from Tim Ferriss. He gave a TED talk. I forget what year it is. I would urge you to look it up. Um, but I think he calls it a fear analysis, or I, I like to refer to it as the cost of inaction. So if you have a, a fear of what might happen because you try something, list down, list the 10 worst case scenarios if you were to go for it. Now, what things, what 10 things can you do today that would help prevent those things from occurring? And then if those worst case things actually do happen, how do you solve them once they do happen? What's the cost? Once you've gone through that exercise, uh, like even for someone that's like concerned with that fear, you're gonna have a pretty good sense of what you're gonna run into. Now, in a parallel exercise, you wanna do what's the cost of inaction? If I don't develop this competency and try to push myself in my career, I'm gonna stay in the exact position I am today till the end of time and how is that gonna impact my life? What's the cost of inaction? And um, what you'll find is the cost of inaction is often greater than the cost of action. Um, that same kind of thing, not to go into personal financing or investing, like that's, that's the same kind of mentality when it comes to putting money in, this, like in the stock market, right? Like to generate real wealth, you wanna be, be an owner of public companies, real estate, and private companies, right? So the stock market is a, is a way that we can all do that. And investing in a company, even though it can be volatile at times in the long haul, over time, 10, 30 year period, you see that money compounds over time, even just on the S&P 500, it returns 10%. So your cost of capital is a compounding 10% growth. But if you're afraid to, of the volatility in the stock market and you hold on to that money, your money's not growing at 10% compounding per year. It's actually losing money every year because the value of the dollar has, has uh, decreased over time. So that kind of same mentality, it's like, you really want to, again, evaluate what's the cost of inaction and always uh, understand the worst case scenario and how do you overcome it if, and with the cost of action. Yeah, that's great uh, decision making advice because I know it's, it's always one of those things that it's, I think it's definitely a great life skill because there's a lot of times, especially for, for younger engineers, maybe they're asked to go speak in front of their office or something and go give a lunch and learn. But I know that's a lot of, that's pretty scary for, for newer engineers. But again, kind of going back to that, that exercise that you just did, like what's the cost of not doing this? Well, you're gonna stay the same, but if, but if you do do it, maybe you might get, you'll help out your office, um, you'll, you'll stand out in your firm a little bit more and you'll get more comfortable speaking in front of other people. The cost of not doing that, you're just gonna stay the same and it's not gonna help your career in any way. So. I think that's a great exercise and kind of diving into that, if you do take action, you know, anything worth it isn't going to be easy. There's going to be times when uh, it's very difficult. Do you have any advice on, on how to get through those difficult times? I, I believe you mentioned, you know, going into the, the power of purpose or why. Could you dive into a little bit more about that to, to show how people can use that to get over difficult times? Yeah, sure. So um, I think for anyone, defining like what they actually want in life is super important. And that can be your why, right? Like, uh, I want to say I heard this on a podcast, they're talking about like, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? And it's like, I would live on the beach in the Caribbean. It's like, well, if that's true, you don't need all the money in the world to actually go do that. So what do you really want? And like, so when you go through that exercise of really defining your why, it creates a lot of clarity in what your goals are this year in five years and what your day-to-day -day actions are actually moving towards. And when you find your purpose, it really helps you overcome the challenging times, right? Like we all face adversity. 
the ones that stick through the adversity are the ones that have meaning beyond like their efforts to overcome all of those hurdles to meet their goal. If their goal at the end of the day, again, can be fear driven, right? It can be like they're attaining that goal because that's what's expected of them in an industry and that's what is, is valued and, and admired within an industry. So they want to achieve it. That person, when the going gets tough, isn't as likely to push through to get that goal because it was really kind of a, a vanity driven goal. It wasn't actually what they wanted. It was what their colleagues or peers valued or what they perceive their peers valued. It might not necessarily be true. So I think going through the exercise to define like, what do you actually want? And that this should be well beyond your career. It's like personal, family, friendships, um, spiritual, mental health, physical, um, you want to really have balance to your, to your personal goals in life. And you want to make sure you're revisiting those and assessing those every year. Um, because then it, it, it reinforces your purpose and your why so that when the going does get tough, you really have a meaning and a reason to push through. I, uh, I, I appreciate that. And I actually, uh, I'm in, I'm, currently pursuing my MBA and uh, I recently just took uh, my organizational leadership ethics and change course. And one of the things that we had to do was identify personal values. And I know you keep coming back to value of the company and, and these, this mission and vision, but um, when you're looking at that power of purpose and you're really trying to focus on what is it that you want to be, what's the legacy you want to leave behind? What is the purpose for, for your energy? Um, what are you trying to contribute? Um, I think it's really interesting because I've been reading a lot of, of articles recently about how as it's important to that for a business so that you have direction and you have some kind of understanding and put things in context as to whether or not you're meeting your own personal objectives, um, you should be doing that exercise, creating a mission and a vision statement and values for your own person, your own being. Um, and I think that your, your suggestion that people be self-reflective and have an idea of what it is that they actually do want to spend their time on um, is kind of aligns with that. Um, I also see that there's a lot more of that direction happening for even young kids when, you know, instead of saying, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, you know, we don't necessarily say I want to be a teacher or a fireman or whatever the noun is. It's actually the, the question that they're trying to ask children when they think about a career is what is it you want to solve? What are the problems you want to solve? What are the things you want to fix? How do you want to make life better for other people? Um, and when you ask about it from a purpose standpoint rather than a positional standpoint, um, it, it changes the dynamic and their, their collection of answers actually widens outside of just the traditional rules that they see in like a kid's book. So I think it's interesting. And I, I, wish, I wish we had all kind of grown up with that mentality of, of purpose over position. Um, and I think it's something that is, is really beneficial regardless of how old you are, 2, 20, or 92. That's great. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Uh, for people that are interested in going through that, I'd highly recommend um, Darren Hardy is the author. It's called Living Your Best Year Ever. And it's basically, it's kind of a, a workbook in a sense, but it kind of walks you through the concept and the meaning behind the exercise. And you reflect on the past year and then kind of, uh, indicate like what you want to change and how you want to grow over the next year. It's like a goal setting exercise, but I've found a ton of value and I've done that every year for the last six years. Me too. My, my, my best friend and I do the exact same exercise. And then we actually select one single word. Um, it's typically a verb, but one single word for our year that encapsulates what we want to achieve. And we, we actually just this week had our like mid year checkpoint of, of how we're going with our goals. And, you know, 2020 has been such a weird year that, everything's gone sideways. So it doesn't matter what word you picked. It has come out in the wash completely different, but you know, it's, it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. It's, I, it kind of feels like, you know, you got to treat yourself as a business too. Like what's your purpose? What's your goal? Where are you going? Because yeah, if you're not, uh, I think that's an easy way to get burnt out in your work. If you don't know why you're doing that work in the first place. So uh, great points, guys. I, I think it's really great. And just the power of asking these questions to yourself, it's a, a great way to get yourself aligned and, uh, you know, really see the purpose in your work, whatever you're doing. Or you can see that you're not doing the work that you want to do and you want to go in another direction. Uh, Renz, you know, you have all this uh, development and career success. Did you have any mentors in your life or how important is mentorship to you? And uh, I guess if uh, people are trying to look for some type of mentorship, what's, what's the best way to, 
to do that in their careers. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think it's extremely important to have people in your inner circle or mentors or advisors that you can reach out to, to just debate certain decisions and occurrences that you run into in, in your life, right? You, you want to have a good inner circle that you know is um, there because they care about you and, and they're going to lead with your best interest. Um, that you can openly share your feelings, emotions, and thoughts on, on any of these challenges that you run into so that you're getting sound advice. Um, the other piece to that is, I, I think a, a number of people have said this, but you're basically a summation of the five people you spend the most time with, right? So you want to choose those five people uh, very um, intently. You want to be very aware of who you're spending time with. So if you're looking to advance your career and get to the next step or, or just develop new competencies and grow as a person, um, it's really good to one, find books around those topics because that's going to just really expose you to other people's ideas that have just documented them in books, right? Like when you read a new book on a topic, you're just exposing yourself to somebody else's experience, which you then can grow from much faster than that person that wrote the book. So it's really like a, it's such a big benefit to have all of, especially with technology and Audible and all these things today, like how fast we can get those new experiences through books. Um, in the same way, when you can find people in your life that are striving for similar goals or have achieved a certain level of success or development that you're interested in, it helps to just reach out to those people and try to build a relationship because then they can become your advocates and people to lean on that help guide you through those challenging times or just uh, times of opportunity. Yeah, for sure. It's, I always like to tell people, you know, go, go find a good group of professional organizations or, or whatnot that have, you know, that have the, the right work ethic and kind of the values that you want to emulate because you're going to learn by osmosis. And um, even with leadership, the, the more you're around these types of people that you want to be like, it'll rub off on you and you'll kind of pick up on the habits on, on how to do that. Like I picked that up when we had like an open office on how to talk to clients. I just listen in on you know, uh, some of our managers talking to clients and I was like, oh, that's, that's how you talk to clients. I didn't really ask, but then you kind of learn it just by observing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So I, I'm really excited. We've kind of stepped this, this whole conversation really nicely. Um, you started off by talking a lot about some, some, uh, bigger topics around the, the business level and we've kind of scaled it down to the individual and then the circle around the individual and, and how you can, you know, be, have, take ownership over your own career and then work with others and, and have mentors uh, to learn and grow. And I want to kind of come back full circle and bring it back to the overall work environment. So um, I know you have a really strong belief that every person deserves to work in uh, a positive work environment and have those opportunities for advancement. And I think you've done a really great job of, of kind of talking to us about the advancement portion. But I'd like for us to close on what it is to build a positive work environment. I think that's such a fantastic concept and. Um, I think it's something that a lot of younger engineers are demand maybe more than other um, more tenured engineers, but I think it is something that should be ubiquitous in, in any industry, not just engineering. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your opinion on a positive work environment and how you guys enable that at H&O? Absolutely. And hopefully this doesn't sound like a, a broken record, but it kind of comes back to um, it, it's really building a circle of trust and that's when how we frame the positive work environment is we refer to it as really like a growth environment, an environment for learning and making sure people aren't afraid to make mistakes and ask questions because the second you create, the second there's toxicity or friction or fear of being wrong, like your organization is stagnant. You're dead in the water. There's not really any opportunity for advancement because the people within the company aren't contributing to that advancement anymore because they're afraid to speak up. They're afraid to be wrong. So when you can create an environment that's really about learning and growing and you frame mistakes as like just an opportunity and a new experience that helps, that's something new that can help improve the organization that's creating a mindset, a collaborative work environment, a culture that's really focused on growth and strategy and improving. Um, and when the entire company it starts to think that way and you're going in the same direction, not to go back to mission, vision, and values, you have a clear direction, you have a clear purpose, you have guiding principles that align decision-making 
and you have a learning environment, like everyone is really rowing in the same direction. And when you have that kind of momentum within an organization, it's going to grow naturally because your clients are going to demand that it grows and your people are going to outgrow the current size of the organization, which is really just going to, which is going to force the organization to grow, to give everyone more opportunities. And that to us is really what it means to lead a fulfilling career. Um, when you can create an organization that delivers such a good experience to your clients and such a good work experience for your team that allows them to grow that it, it just naturally pushes the organization. That, that is so fulfilling to us. And that's like what we're really excited about with the future agent help. I love that. I think that's fantastic. And I think there's one word that, that really is like the bedrock of so many of those, those elements of a positive work environment. And that, that bedrock is trust. Because if you don't believe that your leadership trusts you to try new things, or if you don't trust that if you make a mistake that there aren't going to be, you know, that people are going to be understanding and, and help you embrace that mistake so that you learn from it. Um, then you, you really don't have the room to thrive in an organization. So to my, I guess my, my little tidbit for any of our listeners here is that if you find yourself um, distrusting of the freedom or the, the safety or the security of your team or, or your leader's um, direction that they give you, uh, maybe, maybe do some self-reflection and see you know, where does that distrust lie? And, and that might help you understand you know, where it is that you have room to grow and you have room to contribute directly to your organization and your team by building a better atmosphere of trust that allows this positive work environment uh, to, to, to really take hold and, and root and grow. Totally agree. And for, for people really looking to continue advancing their career, an important piece of trust is that um, I, I always think trust should be given. Um, but then it's also like on the person that we're giving trust to, it's really important that you, your behavior and actions keep that trust, right? So say there's a mistake, which is framed as a learning experience. That's okay when that mistake happens once, but you can't just write it off at this is a learning experience. Uh, I made a mistake. It won't happen again. You need to make sure that you're holding yourself accountable and your team is holding each other accountable that not only was it a mistake, but we really understand the root cause of the symptom, which is the true mistake. You got to understand the root cause and that you're going to actually grow to improve and prevent that mistake from happening again. Uh, a learning environment and an environment of trust isn't like a, just the freedom to make any mistake in the world. It, it's really about the culture and creating learning and improving. So when you can hold yourself accountable to that, that's when that really flourishes and becomes a great place to work. Totally agree. Ah, Renz, thank you so much for joining us today. I think this was a really big um, eye-opener for some of our audience who may be less familiar with some of these more overarching topics to, to running an engineering business. Um, I'm, I'm excited to connect our listeners with you. I know that you're extremely active on LinkedIn. Uh, Matt and I both are as well. So we've, we've got a good little team right here. Um, is that where our listeners should connect with you or are there other places where they can either follow uh, what you're doing or, or get connected? Yeah, please uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. And then uh, if you're interested in checking out uh, H&O Structural Engineering, our website's at hayesoneal.com. H-A-Y-E-S-O-N-E-I-L-L.com. Um, we're always looking to grow um, our relationships with other engineers. So if you're at all interested in just hearing more about H&O or building a relationship, pre please reach out to us through our website or on LinkedIn. We'd be happy to get to know you. Renz, I had one last question for you. I, I know you read a lot of books. Do you have any book recommendations for for young engineers that, you know, that do want to do more of a, this lifelong learning and, and improving themselves? Absolutely. So for anyone out there that's really interested in becoming a lifelong learner or just learning about the importance of being a lifelong learner and how it can impact your life, um, I'd recommend The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Um, that's one of the first books I read a little over, not the first book I ever read, but the first book that led me on building a habit of reading every day. Um, and that was about a little over six years ago. And it's one of the best investments I've made personally. Um, I've grown so much as a person just from listening to audiobooks during my commute every day. And I've now come to recognize that time as the most important part of my day. Um, and for those that are looking to understand the nuances and inefficiencies in, in uh, most organizations, uh, the E-Myth, 
which is The Entrepreneurial Myth by Michael Gerber, is a great second book to read. So that's The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, and then The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It walks through like the, the typical growth of a small business and the hurdles, obstacles, and challenges that they face. And I know the first time that I read that book, literally every single frustration and challenge and mistake that they made in that organization, I saw in all of my work experiences. And it's only built my awareness. Um, and when you start to read these books, really what those experiences do, it helps build your awareness of what causes the symptoms that drive our emotions and frustrations on a day-to-day. -day. And it's a really empowering thing to become aware of what causes those frustrations, because then it gives us as individuals the control that we need to see past those, how to solve them, how to navigate those to still lead a fulfilling life. Yeah, I actually read the E-Myth and yeah, definitely a great book. And you know, it's definitely helped me out in, in my career too. Like, you know, I, I'm an employee, so, you know, not entrepreneur, but knowing what they go through, how, what, how the stages of a business, it lets you add more value to your company, seeing what their uh, processes are, their weaknesses are, like you were saying. And, you know, like for me, I saw like one of the things was maybe our onboarding process that could use some help. I can help out on that, you know, on my free time, things to help the, the company out. So it's a great way to see a bigger picture and how you can help out your company in more than just a, you know, a numbers way. So uh, definitely a great book and to build more awareness. Yeah, it's well said, Matt. And you, you mentioned earlier that we're all kind of like our own individual companies, right? And that we're working for the organization. But we're really, like if you think of yourself as your own company, the organization's really your sole client. So when you're reading and, and, and building your own competencies and awareness to those things, it's only providing you opportunity and a new perspective on how to deliver value to your client. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary with the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 33, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, and books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune in to your podcasts. Until next time, wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.